Well, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. Alrighty, so today's seminar is going to be about a lot of things, and uh, we're going to talk about capital gains taxes, we're going to talk about 1031 exchanges, we've seen a little bit about successful estate planning strategies, we're going to dabble a little bit into trusts, wills, and probate. All of these topics essentially roll up and into what I call real estate planning. Did you know, fun fact, 67% of Americans don't even have a will? 65% of Americans don't even have a family financial planner managing their money. Okay, people tend to have a family trust attorney, they have a family tax planner, CPA, hopefully they have a family therapist, but who is managing their family real estate? The information that you're about to hear is intended to empower you to discover something new about your situation. It may at times feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, which is okay, but please save your questions for Q&A at the end. If it's a very situational question, definitely put some time on my calendar so that we can go over it. I do no obligation strategy sessions all the time, uh, both in person and Zoom. So I uh, highly recommend uh, getting on my calendar so that we can talk about your situation. So I'm speaker number two today. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, my name's Melissa Tierney. I'm a certified real estate planner. I'm a realtor based here in Santa Barbara, and I specifically work with people to build, protect, and transfer their generational wealth through real estate. After spending a decade in software sales, living abroad a few times, and working with tech companies in the United States, I saw firsthand when I was shepherding my grandmother into her retirement journey that there's really a need um, in the senior and aging population to to, to serve them and, and help shepherd them through their individual decisions, provide them with a framework for questions that need to, ans that need to be answered, and also um, just really focusing on providing that complete family of companies to service all the things that they may or may not end up going through. So I personally recognize that you know one in every three properties in many markets of, in the United States are actually rentals and they're owned by seniors. So I've carved out a niche within the niche to help property owners navigate their real estate exit strategies while still capitalizing on their investments. Right now I am licensed uh, to sell real estate in the state of California. I recently closed deals in Northern California, Los Angeles, and I have a listing right now in Fresno actually. But because of the way I operate, I partner with people, not just in our state, but nationwide, to also help people identify promising investment opportunities. So outside of real estate, you can find me at the beach with my sons. Fun fact, I'm also the master swim coach of our local YMCA. Do we have any YMCA members here in the room? Ha, <laughs> all right, cool, see you. Um, and I also sponsor and volunteer some of my time at local communities such as this to um, sponsor their game nights and other activities that they have planned for their residents. So we'll hear from Charles after you hear from me. So our goal today, and um, before we really dive into the, the agenda, show of hands, do we have any investors in the room? Wait for you. Okay. So do we have anybody in the room who owns more than two properties? Okay. So investors, how have you done it? Have you done 1031 exchanges before? Do we have any experience? Okay. So did you know that up to 60% of 1031 exchanges are actually unsuccessful? Really? Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into the weeds a little bit about that. But just to give you an overview of the presentation that you're about to see, we're going to kind of do a little bit of real estate high level. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common questions that I get from buyers and sellers. And then I'm going to show you what to expect with real estate planning. How to plan for capital gains tax, for example. Legacy planning, even family feud prevention planning. Um, we're going to show you how the 1031 exchange process works. I'm going to show you where exactly it gets stuck and how we've bulletproofed our process um, that enables anybody who's doing this to really create a legacy plan that will in fact build, protect, and transfer their generational wealth. So ultimately, again, I hope you can use this to 
as, as, as information to add to your toolbox. I'm not a CPA, I'm not an attorney, I'm just imparting on you information that I've experienced in the field. And then again, lastly, don't be afraid to book time on my calendar because I do strategy sessions all the time for people. So just market outlook across the board. We have an election, an election coming up. And you know, every year that there's an election coming up, we always see kind of the same trend where home sales tend to slow down a little bit because people are uneasy and not sure what to expect. And then after the election, the home sales tend to snowball. But you know, across the board, looking at high level right now, the number of home sales in the United States have actually lingered at 30 year lows. And since 70 million more Americans live in the country now as compared to three decades ago, it's kind of inevitable that sales will rise in the coming years and inventory will grow more steadily. But in terms of inventory, prices will always be comparatively high as long as there is no inventory. Now, some areas saw increases in inventory. Generally speaking, California saw increases of about 37% in terms of number of homes available for sale. And in our own market here locally, we nudged slightly up into the three month supply of inventory. And just FYI, a balanced market is considered six month supply. But until those numbers really get higher, we will remain in a seller's market with high pricing. And anybody who lives indoors is paying a mortgage, it's just a question of who's. So is it the right time to buy? That's, this is a question I get all the time. Should I buy now? Is it the right time? Well, it's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market that matters in real estate. We are seeing a lot of headlines, for example, showing price reduction, still on the market, very motivated seller. Homes are sitting on the market for 30 days or more unless they are priced very, very aggressively. And it is important to note that for every point increase in mortgage rates, buyers lose about 10% of their buying power. So the combination of this plus the headlines that we're seeing results in buyers not being as motivated to buy something, especially if they believe the price is going to decrease. So in terms of mortgage rates, it seems to be the hot button over the last year, we've already seen a slight decrease in rates. And according to this graph, it's really looking like we can expect more of the same. You know, buyer mentality, buyer sentiment is very, very low. There's a lack of motivation there. Um, investors, if we have real estate investors, you know, they have a trick up their sleeve, which is called the DSCR loan. Has anybody heard of a DSCR loan? <laughs> so a DSCR, write this down, DSCR, it's a loan based on rental income projections. Mortgage rates have no impact on investors using DSCR loans. And actually, fun fact, I was talking to uh, another loan officer just yesterday, and he was saying that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae have really doubled down on uh, rates for second homes. And so the loans available for purchasing a second home have essentially increased more so than they should have. And so if you're looking to buy a second home, um, you know, they're, they're just, there's a lot of volatility going on right now. So you know, just going back to mortgage rates for consumers, according to the National Association of Realtors, we have the most difficult affordability in nearly 40 years. So context to that, um, we live in an area where here in Santa Barbara where the average price of a single family home is 1.5 million, which assuming a 20% down payment would yield approximately $9,000 per month for the monthly payment. And then side note, does anybody remember in the 1980s and 90s when rates were double digits? My parents remind me every single day. <laughs> when you were a baby. Anyway. Um, yeah, so comparatively speaking, this is pretty low. But one thing to note um, before we move into the next slide is that appreciation has been positive and pretty significant. It's been lower over the last year across the board and it will continue to increase at a slower rate um, over the next year. But 
the jury's still out and the professionals are currently thinking and estimating that we're going to have 3.8% appreciation for 2024 as compared to 2023. We will in fact see how that plays out. So a little bit more about me, you know, what is this real estate planner crap? You know, I'm a Keller Williams certified real estate planner and I'm on a team called the Complete Real Estate Group which consists of 19 of us certified planners we cover from San Diego up to San Francisco, and we just added some folks on the East Coast. I'm based here in Santa Barbara, and uh, the Keller Williams real estate planner community itself consists of over 500 partner agents across the United States. The idea of a real estate planner isn't new, but this official certification is. It's a very specialized field dedicated to assisting aging adults, many of whom, as I mentioned, are investors whether accidentally or purposefully, and putting together a plan for their real estate because as I mentioned, one out of every three properties is an investment property and to optimally support this niche, we have studied things like 1031 exchanges, senior relocation services, DSTs, trusts, real estate planning because it supports the entire family in holistically ensuring that their wealth is protected and transferred at all levels. And it's not just this coursework and tests that I took that ultimately define what we do. It's ultimately a promise of expertise that guides family through their real estate, and it's a job as a multi-generational realtor that I take very seriously. So show of hands, who has heard of a situation where a family inherited some money and it ended up in a family fight or court? Weird. And the sad part is that I talk to trust attorneys. And, and CPAs, and they're, they're in the same boat where we're trying to protect our clients and their assets, but the attorneys are not able to set them up with a family feud prevention plan, and once they get a trust set up and that person, their client, passes away, many times the beneficiaries end up fighting over it, and the process of putting together a real estate plan, which I'm about to show you, is it will accidentally build a legacy plan and it could potentially result in family prevention planning. Um, but one thing that we, it is important to note is that we are about to see the largest transfer of wealth in United States history as baby boomers and their parents age up and out of their homes. So my question is, who is managing that wealth? Because that's a lot of wealth. 52% of home sellers right now are baby boomers, and 90% of younger boomers are looking to downsize. Older adults who have built equity over many years are in the best position ever to purchase homes. So these, there are lots of statistics like this, but I do what I do because it's the multifaceted support that I believe every, every family needs to have. I've personally experienced it, and sadly, only 30% of the population is actually proactive in planning their retirement, and so I, I just, the 30% that's here, thank you for showing up. And um, my personal goal is to elevate that statistic to as high as we can possibly get it. So how does this tie into real estate planning? Uh, remember what I said, well actually I didn't say this yet. How many people in the room have kids? Do, okay, does anybody in the room have kids who are alike? That's funny, oh. weird. Um, okay, so, you know, let's say, God forbid, something happens. And, you know, you have the one kid who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, total aficionado, and says, we're going to live this house up. And you've got the other one who's in a different phase of life. The other one says, hey, you need to sell it. So essentially, when a lot of people say to me, my house is in the trust, and my kids are going to fight over it when I'm gone, well, here's what you're doing. If you want to do it, that's fine. Will support you no matter what but here's what's going to happen you're going to put these siblings who are very different in different phases of life have different priorities have different bank accounts and you're going to put them together and in business together with the largest quantity of wealth that they have likely ever seen how do you think that's going to go <laughs> so i get a lot of questions also about transferring property ownership and the short answer is in many cases and again I'm not an attorney in many cases you want what's called a step up in cost basis um, 
many times I come across families who say that they want to bless their kids while they're alive and they want to do so by adding them to the title of their family home. And if you look at this chart, you will see that that actually will do them a disservice. So let's say you have your home, you bought it for $100,000, whenever that was. Mm -hmm. the, the child inherits the home at this value, and then they meet with me and I say, well, you're probably looking at 2.5 million for a sale price. And they're like, great, I'm gonna sell it right now. Yeah. Put it on the market, they're going to be taxed on $2.4 million worth of gain. It's a hell of a bill. This is what we want. We want the step up in cost basis because that same $100,000 home, mom and or dad pass away, you get what's called a date of death appraisal. They, they, inherit, they now are uh, at the value of the home at the date of death appraisal. So when I say, well, that's $2.5 million sales price and that coupled with other things would now be your new cost basis. If they wanna sell, we're potentially not looking at any taxable gain here. But this is just part one. Now, other people have come to me with questions about Prop 19 and how that would affect them. You can actually Google Proposition 19 California fact sheet. Take that out, but go to do that, write your questions on the back of that, and take it to your CPA. Uh, because there are a lot of nuanced things in there that that people over 55 need to know. I can answer questions about Prop 19 if you get there. And talk to him too. Mm -hmm. All right, so in my work with my senior relocation services certification, we find ourselves in a myriad of different situations with families, but ultimately the one question is always asked. I ask, how are things going in your current home? Now, it is very important. How many of us still have our parents around? How many of us are our parents? <laughs> but it is very important to ask yourself the following question. What are your activities of daily living? So you'll want to think about that as the, the acronym for that is ADL. And that is a, a very popular term that is used by everybody in the senior industry. What do they look like? How are they going? So I actually have a seminar completely dedicated to that alone, and I can let you know when the next one for that is. But regardless of the outcome of how the home's working out, what's going on, um, do you have life insurance, long-term uh, care insurance, um, those are all questions that come about, but the what, but how they all funnel down together into the next phase is, what are we doing with the house? And ultimately, that's either going to be an emotional decision or a very logical decision. Or maybe, you know, you're just thinking about, well, I'm just trying to get rid of stairs. I'm just tired of yard work, I'm tired of maintenance, I'm tired of cooking and cleaning. Solidarity on that one, actually. But one of the most common responses is, you know, well, I have it in a trust, and you know, we all know what's going to happen with that. <laughs> but what if, what if you met with me and I said, well, if your home is no longer working out for you, what if you rent it out for two tax seasons and turn it into an income-producing investment property? Then when you sell it, you can do a 1031 exchange that will hopefully, optimally, defer, if any, capital gains taxes, and then what? You buy another income-producing property, this is the start of how we help people to build, protect, and transfer generational wealth, so you see the shift in the thinking there. It's more, it's into more strategic and calculated thinking. And so, just going down that logical rabbit hole just a little bit, when people meet with me, you know, we, we talk about a lot of things, and the first, one of the first things I want to do is determine, is this home protected? Who here has a will? Well, who has a trust? I know you have a trust. Um, 
All right, so the whole point of having a trust is to provide protection to your estate so that it doesn't end up in probate court. Many people are under the assumption that just by having a will, they're protected. No, no. So a will is, well, you need a trust because essentially, and I have a state planning attorneys who will talk in depth about this, and coincidentally, Sam can talk to you about this as well, but there are many different types of trusts. Um, you want your trust to be funded. If it is not funded and something, God forbid, happens to you, your estate could still be in probate court. I digress, I'm not an attorney, but I highly recommend seeking an attorney on this and then just be the last thing I want you to take away from this is for those of us who have trusts, who have you designated as your trustee? The most responsible child, a sibling? Okay. Um, and again, I, have a, I actually have a webinar on this that I did with another real estate planner. It's on my YouTube channel if you wanna watch it. But the trustee actually has 21 bona fide responsibilities to carry out it is a it is an actual full-time job and in many cases the trustees are going to be taking on this new full-time job while they're in a grieving process I don't recommend that for them but I do recommend seeking out the advice of a professional fiduciary there are private fiduciaries here in town that that I work with that are phenomenal and are able to take responsibilities off of the family's plate so they can actually process their new life and move through the grieving process. So that is something that, that I recommend for speech. Which dovetails into, you know, two, there, there are actually two different properties, just going back a smidge to the emotional investment and the logical investment. Just a hint, you guys live in the emotional one. Um, in the emotional one, that you live in, you qualify based off of the scenario for a capital gains tax exemption, which is under IRS code 121C. If you were to sell the home, every person who was on title claiming it as their primary residence could qualify for $250,000 tax exemption or $500 for a married couple on that gain. You'll see the math on the next slide. But the 121C exemption does not apply to investment properties. Those are treated differently. So if you go in the direction of selling your home or any home, you will, you should, get a net sheet from the title company that will show you exactly what your proceeds will be if you sell at your designated price. Many realtors use this as a tool to show you how much money you can make, but the problem with that is that it's missing the biggest line item, which is what the capital gains taxes will be. Many people come to me and say, I'm thinking of selling my house because I need to pay for retirement and I don't know how to do that. So as a real estate planner, I'm gonna go straight into looking what your capital gains taxes could be, and they need to be verified by your CPA, by the way, and I'm gonna work backwards from there. A lot of people in town who sell real estate are always talking about getting best exposure, doing the best marketing, and getting the highest prices and full commissions, but do you really care what I charge or what I get you if you find out after the fact that you may have to pay up to 42% in capital gains taxes? Well, lucky for me, I know, lucky for my clients, I know how to defer capital gains taxes and I break my corporate records, so, you know, they get the best so the, the point of this is this is where you should start, is to look at capital gains taxes, and this is how I calculate, or estimate, calcul capital gains taxes for people when I meet with them. So when we look at the prime, this is for a primary residence, and what you don't see in this red star is you must see a CPA. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna determine the cost basis, what you paid for the home, are there improvements that have been done to the home? With receipts, we run the numbers. You can expect up to, potentially depending on where you are in your tax bracket, capital 
capital gains taxes could very well be up to 42%. This is where a highly qualified CPA comes in handy. Now here it is for an investment property. And again, why we need a CPA. They should be having conversations with you on the regular about how to maximize the depreciation on your real estate investments because you could have 27 and a half years and they should be saying, okay, over this amount of time, you're gonna break even right here, you should sell right here. And then we move on to the next investment asset where we recapture depreciation. Now remember, if you're not going to exchange an investment property for a lifetime property, you may, may very well pay capital gains taxes on what you made on the property plus the amount that was not depreciated on if you didn't capture that depreciation. So again, it's important to have a qualified CPA. Now this is my tool that I use to determine really, well really to treat how, uh, real estate as a financial product. That way you can look at how much you're actually making and then determine if you should keep it or sell it. I just had a client that has four properties. We ran numbers on each of the four properties and we determined that one of them, which was a long-term rental, was underperforming by about 30%. So we made the decision that we're gonna do, we're gonna put it on the market, let somebody else deal with it, and they're gonna invest um, on the East Coast into a midterm rental that is actually um, producing more cash flow. So they will have a better performing asset. But this, these just kind of, explains the, the formulas and what we really look for. Um, again, I'm not a CPA, but what we do is we run through these numbers, we give them to you, and you take them to be verified by your CPA, and hopefully me and Sam, so that we can all come together and really start working on your real estate plan, because everything that you've seen so far is just the baseline. So going down the financial and logical decision-making process, do you, do you know why it's called a 1031 exchange? Anybody know? Because it's literally called the IRS code 1031. It's literally under IRS code 1031. And it allows you to postpone paying tax on the gain if you reinvest the proceeds in a similar property as part of a like a qualifying like kind exchange, which you will see on the next slide. Now I keep saying you need a qualified CPA. What does that mean? Well, there are different types of CPAs. There's, there are CPAs who fill out your tax returns and they submit them to the IRS. They, they file your taxes, but they don't look at your taxes and look for ways to defer taxes. And you want that letter. So, the, so going into the 1031 exchange, the first rule of a 1031 exchange is you must go investment for investment with like kind properties that can be seen on this graph. Now any of these qualify for a 1031 exchange. Now it used to be such that if you owned a condo, you had to go into a condo or it was single family home for single family home. But now you could go single family home to a shopping center or land. When did that change? Early 2000s. Does it have to be real estate or could it be like a, a mutual fund? Has to be real estate. Has to be real estate. Has to be real estate. Yeah. Rule two, must be greater or equal value, otherwise you end up with what's called boot, which is the difference it's not of equal or greater value. And guess what, you get taxed on that difference. So, does anybody know what happens if you fail a 1031 exchange? Pay the tax. You pay taxes. You pay capital gains taxes. And so the next rule of what happens in a 1031 exchange is you must use a qualified intermediary slash accommodator, which is essentially a neutral third party um, that will literally oversee the entire exchange process and will exchange the funds 
per the IRS guidelines. Now, the, there are, well, how do I say this nicely? It's very important that you select your QI based on their track record, their experience, and the fact that they've never lost a client's money. <laughs> But if you look at this visual, you will see that in a 1031 exchange, you're not exchanging money. You're not transacting money. You have a neutral third party literally exchanging money for you. The money is never touching your hands. So it is of penultimate importance that you have a real estate team that has your back, not just with the transaction coordinators, Tyler Escrow, and an agent who actually knows about the time frames and other things that go in with it, but a QI that can facilitate this and the CPA and more. Our group has never failed a 1031 exchange. We actually have a fail safe um, strategy that many have come to us for. We'll cover that in a couple of slides, but this is just rule three. Timelines. This is where people get stuck. So from time, from the time you sell to the time you close, no more than 180 days can pass. And you'll see a graph on the next slide. You must identify your replacement property within 45 days of closing escrow on the property that you're selling. Because what happens if you fail this, you pay capital gains taxes. Now another thing to keep in mind is if you're looking for something, it can be equal or greater value, or it can follow the 200% rule. Um, last rule is that the property must be held by the same taxpayer. So here is that visual that I was mentioning. This is what you'll want to take pictures of. Um, we've had a couple of people come to us and say, we've got a tight timeline, but this is what happens. Somebody says, I want to sell it, they put it on the market, and then they get stuck right about here. The replacement property falls out of escrow and or other things happen, and then they have to go back to square one. And if you, can, if you do not follow that time period, it's over. But this is where we've developed a niche, and you'll hear more. This is where Charles is going to come in obviously after I'm done, and, uh, and talk to you about the details of it. But the Delaware Statutory Trust, um, let me just go back a couple of slides. So that's, we have a secret, our secret sauce right here is with the Delaware Statutory Trust on the right hand side. So the Delaware Statutory Trust is considered like kind property as of the early 2000s. And I've come across many tired landlords who were really done with getting calls. And, the new land, and with the new landlord laws that are in effect, people are pretty motivated to sell. So they sell their property and they do a 1031 exchange into what's known as a DST. It functions very similarly to an annuity. Um, Charles, again, is going to give you more details on this. But the, the one downside to this is that it is not liquid. You have to let it run its course. High level DSTs own very high quality institutional property. Um, these are going to be, for example, your Amazon warehouses. But the biggest challenge of investing in a DST is being able to find one. Not all DST investments can be marketed directly to the public because of SEC regulations. Um, that's why you come, come to us and talk about them because we know about them, and they are the formula that we use to essentially bulletproof our 1031 exchanges. So when it comes to 1031 exchanges, these are just some good, good things to know about why they're so beneficial. But here's a case study that I wanted to, to show you. This is an actual real estate plan in action that resulted in some very fruitful legacy planning and family feud prevention. Side note, there are a lot of different directions this case study could have gone. But the client, her name is Anne, wanted it this way. So this is the story of a woman named Anne, her husband who owned a commercial property apartment building, passed away 
and she found herself in a position where she wanted to bless her children while she was still alive. Now, this commercial property was owned by their trust, and so after collaborating with her estate planning attorney and her CPA and her fin family financial planner, the, we were able to do a 1031 exchange of that property, and the trust was able to put a down payment on a single family home for each of the kids. They were able to predetermine their inheritance. Bye bye, family feud. And then when the mom, Ann, ultimately passed away, they received a step up in basis on their own homes. Now, there are a lot of different ways that this could have gone. First of all, if that had been a single family home, it would have been a little bit different. But she could have also done. Um, she could have also give, given, sold it and given money as a gift. Then she would have been subject to gift taxes. She could have also done um, a deferred sales trust. That's a whole nother rabbit hole, but some people consider it. Um, she could have even involved a charitable remainder trust. There are lots of ways that this could have gone, but ultimately that's, that's a very good success story that we share with our clients because not every situation is the same, but it just shows the potential that not only does real estate planning um, result in your favor, you have more control, obviously, but when done correctly, it could, it could benefit the entire family. And it's important to have the right framework in place because ultimately, while retirement is very much an individual decision, it is also a choice of lifestyle for the family as well. So, um, there is my contact information. Uh, if you scan the QR code, you will get on my calendar. But save my contact information and let's, let's talk about what's unique in your situation. So one last thing before I pass the baton to my colleague Charles, um, you know, just kind of going down that case study rabbit hole, you know, what if she realized too late that she, sorry, what if she had actually taken on that property? And what if she realized too late that she didn't want to manage it? Um, it? What if you're a tired landlord looking for an exit, a profitable one, but you still want to be in real estate? Um, there are a lot of answers to those questions in the next presentation. So that's what we consider to be our secret sauce to bulletproofing our 1031 exchanges, and it also illustrates the beauty of having a real estate plan and how it can benefit the entire family. Yeah. I see your strategy session is free, so what are your fees? I only make money when I transact homes. I'm a licensed oh. realtor. Oh, okay. So if we put together a plan and it makes sense, I would get, I would, I would yeah, get paid on commissions. So and you, then, don't, you don't actually charge an hourly rate or anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. And the other thing too is just with the things that I've been